We're going to cram a full sermon into a short time. There's a long way to go and a short time to get there. Oh. Mark chapter 1. As you're opening your Bible to that, would you please pray with me? Oh God of heaven, we do thank you so very much for who you are and for how you work. How you stir and, and, and move within us that we might see how you see that our hearts might be filled with your love and what's more that you might stir and work in our lives so that we might participate in the work that you call us to as a part of the advance of your gospel. I thank you, Lord, for this church family. I thank you for each and every one who has said yes to you, who walks with you. And, and, and Lord, this morning, I just ask that you would bless them in very really real and personal ways, in ways that they know are just between you and them. And God, that you might be honored and glorified here in all we say, think, and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark chapter 1. I try. I do. I try. Uh, when preparing for a Sunday message to take the text and to glean out of it all that I think that that God has, uh, you know, in store for, uh, in truth, uh, uh, you know, like we said before, we're studying uh, the book of Mark to, to learn the gospel, not just to, uh, you know, to talk about it, but to, to, to see the, the, the very facets of the life and ministry of Jesus for the, the very kingdom rule and reign and everything that that embodies. And we're going to, of course, look at the crowds and look at the disciples and, and look at all that he has in store for us. And, and as we go through the text, um, I know much to your frustration, I apologize, but I go through the text and then I, I try to hold the text in one hand, and what does this mean, the truth of it, and then the other hand try to say, okay, now how do we apply that? How do we apply that? Okay, uh, I'm not very good at that part, uh, you know, about coming up with uh, the three-point application pieces, uh, I try. Um, this week was particularly hard. Um, I think it was hard in part because uh, it was hard in part because I was just so overwhelmed with the character of Jesus. So that you could say the application is Jesus. But then you know that that's the answer to all application. <laughs> And so I was really wrestling with how we might do this. And so uh, I, uh, I know today we're going to look at to what it means to see like Jesus sees. What it means to feel like Jesus feels. And to do what Jesus does. I was trying to create a word for that. I called it see, feel, do. And I practiced at home. And my wife said, what did you say? And I said, Seal field do. I said it with great confidence, like it was a real word. I explained it to her, and then she said, Hey, don't make a big deal about that in your sermon. <laughs> so we, we won't. So I thought it might be, uh, no, I won't make a big deal out of it. But we do want to look to this account of God's word in the time that we have, and try not to burn your dinner that's at home in the time that we have left, but. Look with me, if you will, at Mark chapter 1, and we're going to begin where we left off. We'll look at, begin in verse 29. Uh, and immediately he, that being Jesus, immediately Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Interestingly enough, uh, he leaves the synagogue and he heads out. Now it could just be uh, time for dinner. Uh, but he's going to the house of Simon and Andrew. Now, mind you, they're brothers. Okay, Simon and Andrew are brothers. And it says that he entered the house of Simon and Andrew. Well, who owns the house? Who's got the deed? Right? Housing is completely different than what we have it today, ladies and gentlemen. Because not only is it the house of Simon and Andrew, it's not a bachelor pad. Because we're about to be introduced to Peter's mother-in-law. She's there too. Okay, so Peter's wife and his mother-in-law, and Andrew's family, and they're there with James and John. Uh, we know from Luke chapter 5, verse 10, that those are business partners. They're all, they've, they've been together long since. So Jesus, in the midst of this family, 
In the midst of it, leaves the synagogue and here in the family. And it doesn't matter whether you're in the synagogue or whether you're in your house. Ministry is taking place. Did you hear me? And I dare say that some of the most powerful and profound ministry I've ever experienced in my life has been in your homes. Kitchen conversations. Living room conversations. Jesus, Simon, Andrew, James, and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever. And immediately they told him about her. And he came up and he took her by the hand and he lifted her up. And the fever left and she began to serve them. And that evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now I got here late a little bit, but I did hear Joel's opening sermon and, uh, message, and it's one that I used also today. And it was just to look at the fact that Jesus would not permit the demons to speak. We've talked about it before. Jesus is in full control of absolutely everything that's going to happen over the next three years. The ministry, his earthly ministry of three years, Jesus is in full control of absolutely everything that's going to happen. And so Jesus, as we looked at last time, he uh, had an encounter still in Mark chapter 1, an encounter with another demonic uh, possessed individual. And that individual uh, he came out and he said, Jesus, now what do you have to do with us? We know who you are, the Holy One of God. Right? So that's been revealed that they know who God is. And Jesus said, will not permit them to speak because they knew who he was. And so on the other side of the uh, purposeful advance of the gospel, the ministry and the work that Jesus is doing is a whole spiritual battle that means to thwart that. It means to derail it. It means to do whatever. Jesus won't permit them to speak. He knows who they are. They know who he is. How is that possible? Joel made mention of it earlier today at the beginning of the sermon. Because Jesus is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. For by Jesus all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through and for Him. Jesus created I can't imagine. I, I, I try to imagine. Maybe you try to imagine too. I try, I try to imagine. I try to insert myself into the I try to insert myself into the story. I try to see myself as one person in the crowd. I try to see myself as one of the disciples. Oh, I long, right? Long. I long to hear the voice of Jesus. So powerful, so profound. That it says that the whole city was coming to him. The whole city. Now look, somewhere in this room are fellow exaggerators with me. Right? We say things like, I don't know, who was there? Everybody. Was it really everybody? No, it wasn't everybody, everybody. But in this case, when it says the whole city, it's everybody. What is going on in, in, in the, 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 just, you know, who Jesus is? It's, a, it's, a, it's the, the answer to the questions that we've been studying before. The, in him and by him all things hold together. He's the creator God. He's genius. And there is something so profoundly attracting to him and to what he's doing and, and, and all of these things. That since we are called to be the body of Christ. As though he was making his appeal in and through us. God beseeches us to be reconciled. That is to be one with God. So that that same allure, that same attraction, that same love, that same profound sense of care is evident to a world who needs to know him. Requires us to see and feel and do different. Look at me at verse 35. And very, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed. All right, just take a break there. Some of you are naturally very early risers. Good for you. But don't take this piece of scripture and say, See, 
Jesus rose very early in the morning. That's godly. <laughs> you can make that argument another time, another place. But I think Jesus arose very early in the morning because that's the time that he could get alone. Because there's a work that needs to be done. And the crowds, the whole of the city is pressing in on him. And so very early in the morning, that's where he could get his alone and quiet time. While it was still dark, he departed and he went to a desolate place. And there he prayed. Your quiet time, my quiet time, early in the morning, late in the evening, I don't care what time, but there needs to be a time. There needs to be a time. To do what? To pray. <laughs> we sit in conversation and you say, well, what did Jesus have to pray about? I thought he was God. He is God. To then the first response that a lot of people give when we get into conversations, pastoral conversations too, nonetheless. Why did Jesus pray? <clears throat> he prayed to leave us an example. All right, got that part. Jesus prayed, we prayed, we're commanded to pray. But why was Jesus praying? Didn't he have it all together? Wasn't he doing what he was supposed to be doing? Right? He's, he, he launches ministry, he's called some disciples, he's done a lot of healing, he's done a lot of teaching. What's Jesus got to pray about? Did he not know what the Father wanted? Did he have to ask for direction? I, I, I think Jesus knew. The, the determination that we talked about, Jesus, as I told you before, for this is why which I came. He knew everything that needed to take. He's in full control of absolutely. So why is he praying? So this is part of the problem. When we, when we begin our do, ah, I got it in there. When we begin our growing, our sanctification, our growing more and more like Jesus, we are not going to grow to be more like Jesus until we start to see things like Jesus sees them. And Jesus saw prayer as so important that he rose early in the morning and found a quiet place to do it. But see, we always think about prayer as just simply a time where I can ask God for what I want. Well, did Jesus want for anything? No. Well, then what was he praying? Well, that's where we confess our sin. Well, did Jesus need to confess it? No, Jesus had nothing to confess for sin. You see, God wants to stretch us in our understanding of prayer, too. You think ministering to the whole of the town that he was in, that Jesus might have just been exhausted? Oh, I just got done sleeping. Well, that's why you don't wake up early in the morning. Now, I, I, I propose to you that there are a lot of reasons, but the primary reason here that Jesus prayed was because he, though surrounded by hundreds of people, valued the fellowship that he had with his Father in prayer. To see like Jesus sees is to value our fellowship with God in prayer. To see the great treasure that we have in having a conversation with our Heavenly Father who loves us, who cares, who wants to hear our hopes and dreams and aspirations and our fears and our concerns, who is honored when we say, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, not my will, but Your will. And that when we do those things, God is shaping and working and molding in us, not because of the dutiful responsibility of prayer, but because of our fellowship with Him during that time where He whispers and speaks to our hearts and reminds us and begins to help us see as we should. To see the, 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 the priorities of life the way we should. To see God the way we should. To see our family in the world like he does. Why do we get stuck? Because we don't pray. We need to be in prayer. 
Not to just say, dear God, fix this mess. But to spend time in our fellowship with Him so that we might begin to see and feel how Jesus sees and feels. Look at verse 36. And Simon, that being Peter, and Simon said, uh, and Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and they said, everyone is looking for you. <laughs> and again, that is not an exaggeration. I'll bet they are. But what's that tell you? He rose early in the morning and then sometime later, and I'm going to get your ear, right? Do you think that Simon and Peter and James and John, that, that they didn't get up early in the morning? They're fishermen. What time's the best fishing, Rich? Early in the morning. So he got up before the early risers got up, knowing that the early risers would get up, and then everybody's looking for him. Now, I'm sure that they were wondering about breakfast and everything else, but by the time that Simon and, and Andrew and James and John found him, now they're starting to realize that not only are these four guys looking for him, but the phrase everybody's looking for him is everybody's looking for him. It's true. It's true. Now let's see what Jesus does. Everyone's looking for you. Verse 38, and he said to them, let us go on to the next town that I may preach and uh, preach there also, for that is why I came. And he went through all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out their uh, demons. I have to you, multiple points. Here's the first thing. One, everybody's looking for you. Everyone. And Jesus said to them, good. Man, we've got a great crowd. And this crowd must then affirm that we're supposed to stay here. Wow. Did Jesus? No. That's not what he said. Everyone is looking for you. Jesus, everyone is looking for you. And Jesus said, excellent. Let's set up a tent. No. That's not what Jesus says. Everyone is looking for you. And Jesus said, okay, we got to go. We see that different too. We measure the effectiveness of ministry all too often on attendance. I'm guilty of it. I know you're all guilty of it at some place or point in time. We measure things. We do. That's how we see things. Right? Yeah, we, we do. Hey, how'd your, how'd, your, how'd your class go? How'd your group go? How'd your meeting go? How'd your event go? And the first thing people say, it was great. It was well attended. Fill in the blank. But if we're going to see like Jesus sees, we have to realize that Jesus doesn't count like we count. Right? That's not how he sees it. Jesus said, everybody's looking for me? Okay, but we got to go. Why? Because that's why I came. He's never detoured by his mission. Everybody's looking for you. <laughs> to which Jesus said, okay, time to leave. So that I might preach in other towns. Because that's why I came. Uh, for those of you who have been through 101, you know what's coming next. For those of you who have never been to a 101, after the holidays, we're going to do that. And I invite you to be a part of it. But to get to the punchline, Jesus is the author of the model of church that we embrace here. See, in the United States of America, there are two models of church. One model of church is called the come-to model. The come-to model of church does exactly what the disciples are doing. Everyone's looking for you. You have the crowd. You're it. We're winning. That's the come-to model. Come-to models measure attendance. They measure budgets. They measure staff. They measure effectiveness by, by all of those uh, numerics. But Jesus says, no, we must go to other towns. And that's the other model. Rock Haven has always been modeled as a go-to. A go-to. Go-to where people need to hear the Word of God. See, Jesus says, I, Jesus, everybody's looking for you. Good. I got to go. And he says, I must go so that I can do more healing. Doesn't say that. He doesn't say, I must go so I can create more crowd. Doesn't say that. He says, I must go to preach. For that's the reason why I came. We see some other things about 
how Jesus sees things as well. I find them fascinating, but before I get ahead of myself, I want to make sure we get to the next story. Look with me at verse 40. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. If you will. <laughs> First and foremost, leprosy, very bad. Right? Yeah, digits falling off and things like that. Also, cultural curse. If you have leprosy, you're not even allowed to be in town. This man takes a brave step to come forward and to find Jesus. Upon finding Jesus, he kneels. He submits himself to the authority. He submits himself to the person. He submits himself to every idea, to everything, and simply says accurately and beautifully, sincerely, if you're willing, I know you can heal me. Verse 41. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he made him clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to it, see, see, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer your cleansing. What Moses commanded for a proof to them. But, when he, but he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places and people were commanding him, uh, coming to him from every quarter. Okay, fame upon fame upon fame upon fame. And I actually have sat in a Bible study one time where people sat down and said, why does Jesus keep saying, don't talk about it, and people talk about it? And someone once said, they said, well, this is reverse psychology, and Jesus knew how to use it. That is not true. When Jesus said, don't talk about it, Jesus meant don't talk about it. But these people did it anyway. And this is a perfect case in point. Jesus said, don't talk about it. Rather, go and show yourself to the priest. You know why he said that to that guy? Because Jesus is looking long term. Jesus is looking down. This man has leprosy. He lives outside the town. He's not allowed to be in the synagogue. He's not allowed to shop at all the shopping stores. He's not allowed to go and bathe where other people bathe. He's not allowed to be amongst people. He's not allowed. He's an outcast. He's been shunned. He's been pushed away because he has a disease. And Jesus said, now, don't tell anybody, but just go to the priests who had the power and authority to acknowledge, yeah, you had leprosy and now you don't. Hey, get, you're in. You're welcome back. You get to do everything. Right? The priests had that ability. They had that opportunity in that town, in that village to be able to bring this man back to everything. But he can't help himself. <laughs> he, Jesus is trying to help him. Jesus is trying to say, hey, they look at long term, going through all of his stuff, following the law, go check in, make sure you have, he can't help himself. He just takes off running. And then in his, in his talking about everything that happened and being all whipped up and everything all excited, now the, Jesus can't even get into town. And he said, well, that's a good thing, right? Well, is it? Are we only measuring attendances and crowds and followings? We don't know. This man drops off. I mean, thank God he's healed. Thank God he's healed. But Jesus asked for one thing and something else happened. That doesn't stop him. We'll get into that more in a little bit. Okay? But there is something else that's fascinating to me about looking to Jesus to see how he sees. To feel how he feels. And maybe, maybe the word feel isn't as fair as maybe we should be concerned about what Jesus is concerned about. Does that make sense? Feeling makes it sound like, oh, warm fuzzies. <laughs> but there is, a, there is a call that we start to be concerned more and more about the things that Jesus is concerned about. That we, that we, we stop being so concerned about ourselves and more concerned about what Jesus is doing. And we have this word here that comes up, and the word is pity. And we look at the word pity, and maybe in your translation it uses the word compassion. And it started in a discussion today, or this week, and what those two words mean whether we look at compassion or whether we look to pity. And the fact of the matter is if we're going to see as Jesus sees and we are going to be a concern or feel as Jesus feels, we need to understand those two words. Because in order to be compassionate, you have to first and foremost see things like Jesus sees. If you're going to be a compassionate individual in the world, you need to see the hurt of other people through the lens of Jesus. And I just love this. This picture, it didn't matter whether it was a fever or whether it was leprosy. Both of those things is a thou shalt not touch. But he did the exact opposite. Remember earlier in the account? 
Man was demon possessed. Jesus rebuked the demon and commanded him to come out. And by speaking of his word, the demon had to leave. Jesus didn't have to do a thing. He took, Simon, he took Peter's mother-in-law by the hand and the fever left. He said to the leper, he said to the, I am willing, and then he touched him. Jesus didn't have to touch him, and he didn't have to take her hand to help her up, but he did. Why? Why? Wouldn't a spoken word been enough? Yes, but to feel like Jesus feels, we have to understand that he is constantly compassionate. He sees things correctly and he hurts with those who hurt. And he's so personally invested that the extension of his hand is the measure by how much he cares. Whether you have a fever or whether you're an outcast leper, he's willing to touch. He's willing to give of himself. He's willing to be invested. Now he says he did it out of pity. And this is what I find so fascinating. Compassion is defined in Webster's as, as feeling bad or sorrowful, right? Feeling bad or being sorrowful. Someone, I asked it, I asked an individual, I said, well, if, if compassion is feeling bad, what's pity? And, so, and, and the individual says, well, pity's like feeling really, really, really bad. <laughs> That's not accurate. Pity is sorrow with regret. Sorrow with regret. What did Jesus have to regret? Jesus had nothing to regret. But his pity, the extension of love and compassion, was at the regret that things didn't have to be this way. But they were. It takes me back to the garden. And I know I've shared with some of you, I apologize if it's repetitive, but I think it's worth repeating. Adam and Eve get busted, sins in the world. They try to cover themselves up with, uh, with, with, with plants. Jesus intervenes. He's going to cover them up with animal hides. The only way animals give up their hide is to die. Pre-incarnate Jesus Christ is on his knee. He is skinning that animal like I might skin the deer I get someday. Adam simply stands behind Jesus, watching, learning what he might have to do in the future, and as he stands there, as he sees this death, as he sees this ugliness, as he sees absolutely everything, Adam is overwhelmed. Adam is broken. And he simply whispers to the Lord on his knee. He whispers, I know. Me too. That's regret. Things didn't have to be this way. You only had to trust me. You only had to listen to me. You only had to believe. Fill in the blank. Moved with pity. This man's leprosy wasn't based on something that he did or didn't do, but as the result of sin. We live in a world where people are hurting. They're confused. They're scared. There are a hundred different things and reasons for hurt and lashing out and all of those different things. And we could spend season upon season upon season talking about all of those things. But we need to see each and every circumstance and each and every individual the way Jesus sees them. I know a lot of you are jumping off social media saying, nope, done, can't stand it, right? Not going to be a part of that. I'm not going to do it anymore. Blah, 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 blah. Fill in the blank. People are gnashing and snarling and carrying on and back and forth and on and on. I get it. It hurts. It's horrible. But to see things different, why are they acting like that? Why are they lashing? Well, gnashing. Why are they lashing out? Why are they carrying on? Why are the individuals behaving that way? Are they scared? Are they, are they confused? Are they hurt? Are they wounded? To which you go, no, they're just wicked as all get out. Well, that's possible. They could be wicked as all get out. But the question is this. Do they know Jesus? Do they know Jesus? That's, that's the primary drive. The primary drive in all that we do in order to see things the way Christ sees things is that we first and foremost... See like he sees. 
And there's only two groups of people in the world. Those who are followers of Jesus and those who are lost. And where the church gets into trouble is where we, we engage everyone the same. We engage the lot. We expect the lost to act saved. Lost people can't act saved. It doesn't work. So don't expect the lost to do and, 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 and act like anything but lost. Now, those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they better conduct themselves differently because we're called to do and be like Jesus. And primarily to be like Jesus is for us to see like Jesus sees. And when we see like Jesus sees, when we see that those people that need Christ or those people that need encouragement or those people that need to be reached out to, those people that need to be encouraged, those people that need to know the love of Jesus Christ, compassion wells up within us. And we realize that the world doesn't have to be the way it is. But it is nonetheless, and our call is to engage. Our call is to be involved. Our call is to do. See, feel do. But we can't do that until we're first and foremost open to a risky business. See, because Jesus gives absolutely everything. And what I'm asking you to do is to let Jesus change the tender parts of your heart. That's risky work. See, we say things like, I won't compromise truth. Good. Me either. Ladies and gentlemen, God's truth has never become less true, ever. No more than God's glory becomes less glorious. You and I can't make God more glorious. We can't make God more holy. And we can't make God's truth more truth. But what we can affect is how we love other people. Moved with compassion. Seeing as he sees. We can love in horrible, hard situations so that others might know Jesus too. And that's risky. Because when we put our hearts out like Jesus puts his hearts out, we know people, I know people, I know you have been hurt. But that fellowship with Jesus is important too. Because that's how we know we're giving of ourselves for the benefit of others. And I know this, that's one thing Jesus did for sure. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to seek and to save that which is lost and to give his life a ransom for many. I really went over. <clears throat>